I'm Jim Craig and I'm Senior Product Manager in Red Hat's Global Government Team. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is share our vision for delivering smart city infrastructures in collaboration with the Fireware ecosystem. I'd like to start by setting the scene, kind of sharing what we've learned working with customers in cities around the world and compare that with your experiences. Then I'll share the opportunities followed by some examples of cities that have embarked on this journey and close by considering what the next steps might be. So let's start with looking at the, the current outlook and then move on to what the future challenges might be. So let's set the scene for the, uh, from a, a global level. Uh, we're looking at a population growth from around 7 billion people in the world today to almost 10 billion by 2050. Also by 2050, 68% of these almost 10 billion people, that's almost the current world population today, will live in cities. Now, as you might imagine, this puts a huge strain on an already stressed environmental, social and utility frameworks of the city and, and its broader ecosystem. These are just a few of the challenges that cities are facing and you know, it'd be interesting to see whether these match your own experiences and, and whether we've missed any. But you can see there's quite a broad range right across a spectrum of environmental, social and, of course, the utility frameworks as well. To make matters worse, we are in a climate crisis, which means we are experiencing an increase in the severity and the frequency of extreme weather events. So one such example is droughts, the impacts of a drought uh, on the food system. And so we you know we're seeing uh, a reduction in uh, food production around the world. Drought increases the uh, risk of wildfires and again in California this year we've seen uh, some you know really uh, severe um, uh, wildfires so you know there's, there's another impact from uh, from the climate crisis and then warming oceans provide fuel for ever stronger and more frequent hurricanes and typhoons with wind speeds in excess of 240 kilometers an hour that's over 150 miles an hour this particular picture shows Hurricane uh, shows New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Increased flooding is occurring as well in coastal areas through uh, sea level rise and coastal erosion, and then along rivers and through uh, things like uh, rainfall and storm surges. The reinsurers Swiss Re have also identified over 600 metropolitan areas that are at risk from natural catastrophes, mostly flooding, um, with a higher proportion in uh, Southeast Asia. There have been numerous attempts at developing and deploying smart city solutions around the world with varying degrees of success. And this particular picture is Mumbai at night, and it looks cool. It's modern, it's got skyscrapers, and you can see all kinds of technology at play. You can see lots of building work going on. This is Mumbai from a different angle and by day. So you get this kind of tale of two cities and that exists in uh, to different degrees in cities all across the world. So it, it, what it illustrates uh, is that technology alone isn't going to address these growing problems, which is something we know quite a bit about from, from our own uh, experience. It's not just technology that's going to solve these problems. What we've learned from past experiences working with public and private sector and not-for-profit organisations is a, a non-technical challenge, namely how organisations are structured and operated, which is often based on a traditional and rigid top-down command and control style. So this uh, Inflexibility manifests itself in a number of ways and typically creates a silo mentality with, uh, with no or at best very limited cross-department, cross-agency collaboration. So the re result of this silo mentality is you get these silo or vertical solutions. Uh, so from a smart city perspective, some of them may be Internet of Things, IoT based solutions, um, and they might be fine in very small scale solutions. Uh, but cities, even small cities, are kind of well beyond this scale. And what you start to see is this kind of pro proliferation of these vertically integrated silos. Um, and the, the downside is that they increase complexity, cost, they're very inflexible, 
and any efficiency gains any efficiency gains that you make um, within an individual part department can't be recognised uh, across the entire city. So what's the opportunity? So we've learned that there's there's quite a few challenges uh, around the world today, both technical and non-technical. Um, what we'll do now is just spend a few minutes looking at an approach that's realising positive results in different parts of the world today. So what we're doing really is working across the intersection of public policy, people and platforms. And what we're aiming to do is help public administrators and all the related stakeholders to realise their smart city, smart region objectives. If we take a moment to consider what a smart city is going to deliver to its citizens, we'll see a series of services which depend on a range of factors from your age, your occupation, your physical, mental faculty, and so on. These services, what we call life events, hopefully occur over a long time horizon. We'd like to live a long and healthy life. So if we take me, for example, take you, for example, we were, we were born, our births were registered, and that typically triggered a health screening and immunization invitation. So your parents or your carers would take you to the doctor and they give you injections and check your health and so on weight and all those kinds of things and as we get older we go to school we go into education so that gets registered that we've entered the education system and then hopefully at the end of the education system we get a job we have to register for tax unfortunately and maybe we learn to drive a car again these are all driving license tax registrations these are all interactions with our public administrators and then you know, as we, you know, we buy a car that has to be licensed as well. We decide that, you know, we want to leave home. We want to, you know, our own home. So we buy a house that has to get registered. And maybe we meet our dream partner and get married and have children. And then that cycle starts again. So we have one cycle that's just started and, and running in parallel, but slightly behind the first one. So these are just a few examples of life events that you and I as citizens interact with. Uh, or how we interact with our public officials uh, through these services, which are <clears throat> increasingly delivered online. Now, in any given day, we experience these live events in a whole range of different ways. It could be taking your kids to school, it could be getting to and from the office, maybe a medical appointment or you know, sightseeing while you're on holiday. These are all in possible interaction points with our public administrators. Um, we recognise in order to get these services delivered online and this overall smart city solution delivered, we need to take a structured approach. And it's kind of broken down into these four steps. We look at the organisation. Uh, so this is typically the non-technical challenge that we need to deal with. And then uh, look at uh, how we can create common information models deal with open data, work with open data, and then create this data economy. And I'll, I'll touch on each one of these in a little bit more detail. And we'll start with the organization. Now, you may remember uh, a few moments ago, I talked about the conventional, the traditional organization structure, which is top down. It kind of goes back almost to, to Victorian times where people were managed like machines and they were kind of plugged in to do a specific repetitive task. Um, now, the downside with this, it's command and control, it lacks any kind of flexibility, it's incredibly inflexible, and uh, it also maintains this institution of silos within the organisation, and therefore silos within the applications that are developed as well. Now, to deliver a smart city, we need to break these silos down and promote collaboration. Now, the way we do that is through something we call an open organization. So instead of it being top down, it's bottom up. And what do we mean by that? Well, it means that you know, people join the, the organization um, for a, a kind of a shared sense of, of purpose. They want to engage with other people in the organization. It's really kind of built on collaboration. Collaboration is kind of like the currency in, in which it operates, really. Uh, and uh, from a city point of view or any organization's point of view, we're talking about collaboration inside and outside of the organization as well. Uh, typically, public administrators are dealing with NGOs, for example, and external service providers. So we need to accommodate that. What we found as well and what we've been told by our customers that have adopted this open organization approach is that they are incredibly 
that they're they're a lot more resilient than um, their traditional more rigid structured uh, counterparts, and that makes the organisation more sustainable as well. And this this shift in the organisation structure is necessary to deliver the efficiency uh, of the other steps that I'm going to talk about next. What we're aiming for really is uh, we kind of started with the end in mind here is is really look at what we're aiming for here. We're looking at uh, for an organization that works to deliver integrated services with, with no information silos, no organizational silos. Uh, it needs to be able to pass, share and collaborate data right the way across the entire organization. It uses shared context data and standard APIs to achieve that. And what we then uh, get to is we enable this city level and, cre and increasingly regional level government solution. Common information models are really important. Now, the benefits of, of developing with and working with common information models is the cost of adaptation uh, to achieve this kind of full interoperability interoper among the different systems in the city becomes uh, almost negligible. Uh, this makes the, the system, the solution portable across different cities as well. And then with the right policy levers, like we're seeing in, in Germany right now, for example, smart city infrastructures can be deployed rapidly using tools like Ansible and then easily shared with other cities as well. So you can very rapidly scale up and scale out uh, and, in, and, and, and uh, share these valuable solutions uh, to, uh, to other cities. Um, the context broker and standard APIs that uh, have been developed by Fiware allow these city systems to interconnect as well. So what you start to do is to, is to connect cities together to create smart regions. Open data is kind of really key to this. What we're, we're talking about here is, is pushing the uh, right time open data to third parties. And what that helps to do is to create an innovation ecosystem. And obviously everything is, is run through pro proper authorization and, and access control. We don't just give uh, access to everything to everybody. Uh, and then we use tools like three scale, for example, to provide the API management as well. What we start to get to is this idea of, of supporting a data economy and what the data con economy um, allows us to do is, is, is basically create the city as a platform. So the city becomes a platform and it seamless, seam, seamlessly merges open and commercial data together. Data is consumed by applications as part of an, innov uh, an innovation business model. So you can get new applications, new service providers spinning up and accessing a combination of open data generated by the city and uh, commercial data that's made available by third party data providers. Uh, so you can kind of uh, mash up these different applications based on the different data sets that are available. So what we'll do now is just take a moment and have a look at some kind of real world examples uh, so you can get a sense for what cities around the world have achieved so far. So we're going to start with Valencia in uh, Spain and um, Valencia deployed a global platform called uh, Platforma VLCI and it's really about smart city management. It collects key indicators from a whole range of, uh, of uh, municipal services and it's really about improving their efficiency but also offering the uh, the performance of those uh, those services transparently to citizens um, the benefits they've realized is that you know they've improved the quality of the services provided to their citizens so this the, the life events that I talked about earlier on the, the services that are delivering those life or, or supporting those life events are delivered in, a, in a, a, a higher quality way. The environmental quality of the city has improved as well because it allows people to, uh, to report issues um, that, that can be acted on uh, immediately. And, and uh, conversely, the city can also push out alerts and information about environmental issues in the city as well. It's increased the, uh, the available information on um, additional services for citizens and businesses as well. It's reduced public spending. Uh, public sector is always under extreme pressure 
to keep an eye on the budget, keep both eyes on the budget. So it's allowed them to improve the quality of the services, um, make the service more transparent, but also reduce the cost of delivering those services, which is, is kind of really, really important uh, for public administrators. It's also encouraged um, uh, a spirit of, of innovation and, and entrepreneurship as well. Uh, so it promotes the development of new businesses and local ideas. And again, uh, especially as we were looking that you know how we can support cities and, and you know entire countries uh, to to come out of the uh, the COVID pandemic, this is a great way of encouraging uh, the development of new uh, new applications, new services, new job opportunities, new business opportunities for people in cities as well. And from a public administrator's point of view, what it's done is improve, improved the uh, the decision making process for for the administrators. Another Spanish city, this time uh, Malaga, and uh, Malaga started life as a um, the, the, the smart city project. There started life uh, around becoming an eco efficient city, um, and it comprised of eleven companies uh, headed by Endesa, uh, the the energy company to. And it was really about rationalising the, the user's energy com consumption and cutting overall CO2 emissions. And they've used some Red Hat technology to underpin that, so products like RHEL, um, which gives that kind of the, you know, the resilience, the scalability and the robustness um, to, uh, to, to support the city. But as you can see, uh, looking at the, at the slide here, that not only um, um, sustainability, but also a whole range of other uh, services have been made available to the citizens and to, to holidaymakers as well. So if you get a chance to have a look at um, uh, Malaga Smart, uh, then um, please do. It's, it's, a, it's a very impressive um, smart city deployment. We're going to switch to uh, the other side of the world now. So we go from Spain to, uh, to Uruguay to Montevideo. And, um, the system at Montevideo is around uh, smart transportation. So the, the application is called Como AR, and it's really um, started out to provide bus arrival, time tracking and information to uh, more than 150,000 citizens uh, who use the, the service on a monthly basis. And what they've been able to do is integrate real time data on private and public transportation using IoT uh, capabilities there. And what what that's done is improved the state uh, of Montevideo in terms of decision making and also the traffic services for citizens as well. So the activity control systems, geofencing, virtual mapping of the city's real world geography and vehicle information. So you can kind of overlay um, different bus routes, for example, uh, on a map of the city and, and kind of plot your route. You can see the performance of the different routes you can see. Uh, you know how long it's going to take you to get from one place to another, and it's really improved the uh, the environmental uh, status of the city, but also the the ability for citizens to kind of transit around the city as well. Switching back to Europe now, and this time to Italy, um, Branzacqua is a, um, a water and sewage utility service. In, uh, in Italy, and they provide water and sewage uh, services to um, almost a, a, a million citizens. They also operate 69 self-service self Casa dell'Acqua water kiosks, so uh, water houses, and um, a further 62 water dispensers across the, the Monza and uh, Brianza region. And they dispense still and sparkling water to consumers, and they're purchased through a, re, uh, a rechargeable payment card. Now, the smart kiosks, as well as, as vending uh, water, they also act as a communal hubs. So they're kind of like modern day watering holes, if you like. Uh, so citizens, uh, when they go to the, to the water house to get their water, um, they they meet other um, other uh, neighbours and you know catch up with with uh, with each other and, and how things are going. Um, but um, the water company can also communicate directly with citizens through um, digital displays that exist on uh, uh, in the water houses themselves. And uh, this is all delivered uh, as IoT devices, and it's managed on a, a common, common platform 
using a, a, a range of different microservices. Data is managed in real time from the kiosk to the head office and back to the public, making uh, making the the uh, water utility a lot more agile in how they bring new ideas to life, um, how they collaborate with partners and scale the services uh, across the network as well. Going back to uh, to uh, almost where we started really when we looked at the the challenges faced with uh, with the climate crisis. Um, you know, we've seen a handful of, of smart city deployments as well. And, and looking just ahead slightly, you know, we, we've got this climate crisis, it's on us now, and, you know, what can we do about that as well? What smart city technology can do and, and is starting to be used to, to do is to monitor for extreme weather events. It can alert the necessary actors, and if the city's got some adaptation or um, mitigation methods in place, maybe a flood defence, it can activate those as well. So um, we're, we're seeing it um, being used uh, to, to kind of proactively uh, deal uh, or, or manage uh, the, the climate crisis. Now, in the true spirit of open source, we don't do all this alone. I mentioned at the start that we uh, work with an organization called Fireware. Uh, we are a platinum member of the Fireware Foundation. And Fireware is both an open source technology platform and a, a not-for-profit organization. So imagine the technology side of the organization, uh, like a box of Lego and a box of Lego bricks. And, and what you can do is combine these together to build a range of smart solutions and services. And Fireware as an organization, it's a not-for-profit not foundation. It's based in Berlin in Germany, uh, and it has a global reach through a partner ecosystem of over 340 uh, members and partners now. And it's also spawned in excess of a thousand startups. Uh, some of these partners uh, include Red Hat partners, such as Atos, so a very big partner of ourselves, who are a founding member of uh, Fireware, along with Telefonica and Trigen, NEC, um, you know, a huge customer of us uh, around the world, and, and engineering as well. And so what we do is we work together and we collaborate to create innovative ways to solve the challenges that you've seen uh, in the last few minutes. And also, there are always new challenges coming up. So we're working together to solve those challenges, as I said, in the open source spirit of collaboration. So in terms of what does Red Hat provide to this, uh, to this overall solution? And if you like, you know, we are a horizontal uh, foundation, really, on top of which the smart city infrastructure or platform, if you prefer, uh, can operate. So we are the foundation on top of which the platform is deployed. And what we bring is this, this open and interoperable nature. So it kind of future proofs the, the, uh, the open source architecture. Um, again, the open standards give this sort of deployment flexibility, which is, is really important in a, in a fast changing uh, environment like we have with smart cities. Uh, we also bring things like end to end analytics. So being able to um, you know, analytics at the edge, really, uh, and advanced analytics and machine learning, um, so you can execute uh, at the the, uh, the edge of your network. And also, um, we bring control over the data as well. As you imagine, you're dealing with very, very sensitive um, citizen data, so it's important that that data is, 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 is kept private and secure, and it conforms to all the necessary uh, regulatory uh, rules and uh, uh, and uh, and guidelines. Also, um, again, incredibly popular uh, and, and important is this um, this idea of modularity. So uh, avoiding lock-in, and it's something that the public sector uh, organisations are very very keen on. They don't want citizens' data locked in a system um, that means it can't be moved somewhere else. Uh, so it's 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 kind of uh, top, you know, one of the, the, the top priorities that um, uh, it, it always comes out in conversations. And um, what um, the modularity allows the organization to do as well is kind of capitalize on the existing investments they have. I mean, we've got legacy systems that have been around for a very long time. They not only have a lot of data in there, but they also have a lot of business logic in there. 
and um, you know it's important that we can uh, absorb them into this new world and uh, and and kind of realize extra you know uh, extra value off the data and uh, and the, the information that's in these legacy systems. What we also help do as well is reduce the risk and the complexity. Uh, so simplifying development, deployment and integration tasks, which not only uh, reduce the time to market, but also um, uh, save development costs as well. And as I mentioned earlier on, you know, the, the, the being able to deliver these things and, and reduce the cost of deployment is incredibly important in the public sector world. And end-to-end um, -end security. Um, security across devices, access, auth uh, access, authentication, and applications, as well as data that's in motion and at rest. And uh, a, a final point really on where do, thing, where do these things get deployed? Where do they, where do they play? Um, what we're hearing from a lot of uh, our, our public sector customers, our, our city uh, administrators is that they want to deploy their smart city infrastructure on uh, their own private cloud um, because uh, of the sensitivity of the data, of the complexity, um, they just feel a lot more comfortable, a lot more confident that the data and uh, the uh, the applications and, uh, reside with them. So we we give that um, we give that option, but we also have the the ability to to run in a hybrid model as well. So. If, a, uh, if an organization, if a, a city wants to run uh, a mixture of, of on-prem uh, and uh, in, uh, in the public cloud, then we can accommodate that as well. So that's been a kind of whistle-stop tour of smart cities and you know, how we see in combination with a range of actors, uh, how we can deploy them effectively around the world. I'd just like to thank you for your time and I hope you found it useful. And if you'd like to discuss anything I've talked about in more detail, please feel free to drop me a line. I'm Jim Craig at redhat.com. Thank you very much. Bye for now.